So here are the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, we want to introduce uh, parallelism, uh, and we want to introduce some important concepts, uh, concurrency, parallel program models, parallelism, and parallel computing. And then we're going to talk more specifically about heterogeneous computing. So there are, in fact, many uh, natural and man-made uh, real applications that um, has inherently a lot of parallelism. For example, human sense, uh, a, a normal human, um, they can do different modality of sensing, visual, audio, smell, at the same time. Uh, autonomous driving, so the cars uh, which can drive themselves, will observe the environment and control its movement at the same time. Uh, molecular uh, dynamics, uh, that's the um, you know micro world uh, where all the molecules uh, interact with each other, um, form different um, particles or um, you know um, physical um, um, phenomena. Weather and ocean patterns, of course, it's a, a much in a, a bigger scale. Uh, there are a lot of things happening. Um, you know some places raining and some places snowing at the same time. Cell growth, uh, of course, it's happening. If you have a uh, live uh, organ, then the growth of the cells will be happening at the same time. So there are a lot of things uh, has inherently a large degree of parallelism. Um, in the computing world, what is considered parallel computing? Uh, from an early um, definition, parallel computing is a form of computation in which many ca calculations are carried out simultaneously. Operating on the principle that large problems can be divided into smaller ones, and which are then uh, solved concurrently, i.e. in parallel. Uh, it's a very straightforward concept, but it turns out to be uh, very challenging to implement. It takes a lot of effort. Um, so dividing a bigger task into smaller tasks is the uh, key idea of doing any sort of parallel computing. Um, and we call this uh, decomposition. Decomposition is to change or convert or transform a bigger tasks into smaller tasks and ha have them um, carried out or executed in parallel or simultaneously. Um, mostly we use these two strategies. One is called divide and conquer. One is called scatter and gather. And these, are, these two are uh, also tightly uh, connected to each other. Divide and conquer uh, is to iteratively break a problem, really a bigger one, into smaller problems or sub-problems. And we can keep doing this to break the sub-problems into even smaller problems until the sub-problems can fit well onto the computation resources provided. If you have a processor that can handle um, you know, um, one addition at the same time, uh, and then you have um, multiple processors you can take advantage of, now, given a large computation, you can break the computation, the big, long mathematical equation into smaller pieces to carry out these additions um, as a subtask, as a subproblem. You can break it to smaller pieces so that it can fit eventually to the computation resource. Scatter gather uh, is, uh, on the other hand, to send a subset of the input data to each parallel resource. And after the computation is done, to collect the results and combine them into the result data set. So these two are kind of you know talking about two different things, but oftentimes they have to be used uh, in the same single solution. Some examples on the left side, this is a sorting problem. So given a list of integers, we want to sort them in ascending order. Um, one way to do this is as shown in this diagram, uh, we will break these problems into smaller problems. And we will 
let's say we have eight integers and we have four computing units which can do the sort sorting uh, so we'll break down these um, long list of uh, integers into smaller list so we're gonna have two integers per group as a sub problem and they are mapped into one of these four computing units and these four computing units can do this uh, comparison operation in parallel because they are independent and their result will be uh, given to the next set of um, processors to do so-called merge sort so once you have 310 as a group and 712 as a group and these um, within this each problem these two numbers are sorted and now we're going to do a merge sort to combine these two groups into um, this 37 10 12 sequence and so on we're going to perform a, another level of merge and eventually we have a sorted integer um, on the other hand uh, this second example here shows uh, the matrix uh, actually this uh, uh, vectors uh, dot product dot product is to first given two vectors you first do the element wise uh, multiplication and then add the products together accumulate them so what we can do here is we have these uh, large number of parallel multipliers so we'll divide the original vectors into smaller pieces so that each pair can fit on one of these multipliers. Multipliers take time, resource, but they can do all these smaller pieces in parallel. And now, one important thing you need to uh, understand here is we can do this because the nature of this computation. When you do this dot product, the multiplication of these two pairs, this pair of numbers, is independent with the multiplication of the second pair. So that's a very uh, important basis for you to be able to um, divide these um, big problems into smaller problems because there is inherently parallelism in it. Then the next step is to do uh, addition on these products and for additions we can uh, also use multiple adders to perform and also to collect the result um, you know, in several rounds. Uh, so that's a, a very you know, good example of the scatter and gather. Now let's look at the next example. Um, this is vector multiplication. Vector multiplication is different from the dot product we just saw earlier. This is sometimes called element-wise multiplication. So what we are doing here is given uh, two vectors, A and B, uh, each has uh, n elements in it and we're going to do element-wise uh, multiplication and assign uh, the, the result into a new vector C. Now looking at this problem, um, there are several important features or characteristics of such problems. Uh, first, this is inherently significant data parallelism because for every uh, multiplication out of these n multiplications, they are all independent. So the multiplication of A1 with B1 is independent from the multiplication of A2 and B2. So this is very nice and, and that gives us an opportunity so we can carry out these multiplications uh, in parallel. Also for this particular problem, uh, it has very low arithmetic density. Arithmetic density is what we um, kind of give a qualitative sense about how much computation uh, versus how much uh, memory access. So if you store these vectors in memory, what you have to do here in this, for this example is to load that pair of you know, data. Could be a floating point number. And you perform multiplication. So you load once and you perform this multiplication. And this is very simple actually. That's why we call it it's low arithmetic density. In contrast, if you do, for example, FFT or large, larger or more complex arithmetic operations per single memory read, and that's called high arithmetic density. So, um, this you know, and we we kind of say this qualitatively, uh, but 
think about these two examples. If you have a, a higher uh, uh, arithmetic density versus an uh, example like this one, low arithmetic density, which one will benefit more when you run them on the um, parallel computing resources? The one with the low? Uh, should be the opposite, right? Because you, you can really leverage the ma vast amount of computing resources. Um, you know, compared to if, let's say, you do this one, you have to load again to do another computation, which is very simple. Uh, so the ratio of the computation versus the memory uh, access is, is low. And so you, you, you don't have a chance to utilize the computing resources efficiently. Because they, they, have, they have to be idle uh, before they can um, get the next batch of data to compute. Um, there's no data in dependency here. Uh, no data dependency, uh, that's you know, the same uh, kind of equivalent to um, inherently uh, high parallelism. And also, in this example, the same operation applied across all the uh, A and B elements. Um, and this particular operation is the multiplication. This is a very simple form of task parallelism, which we'll um, talk more. But a task parallelism uh, means that you, you um, okay, I'll, I'll show you an example. This is an illustration of these um, vector multiplication. As you can see that, what we can do is we will use these uh, multiple parallel multiple uh, multipliers to perform these uh, multiplication operations in parallel. And there's no connect communication between a computation because uh, all these computations are independent. There's no need to pass intermediate uh, values around. Um, and if you have dependency, then that's a different story. You have to pass the intermediate value uh, from um, one node to another node or from one computer unit to another computing unit, and that's going to um, drastically reduce the level of parallelism, uh, which means that uh, you will have um, more chances that a computing unit will have to wait until uh, it gets data that coming from another uh, computing unit. Um, for task parallelism, um, so the, the data parallelism is wh where we have uh, different segments or different partitions of data that are being uh, worked on at the same time. Um, for this example, uh, what we're doing is a um, more complex operation on image data. We have three operations. We first apply FFT uh, filter and then we do a frequency space filter, and then we have an inverse FFT. Kind of adding some, for example, uh, you know, doing segmentation of the images, or adding shades, or invert uh, the colors, etc. So whatever you know, fancy mem uh, image operations you can apply. So in this example, we have three uh, distinct uh, operations. FFT, frequency space filter, and inverse FFT. And in order to be efficient, the ideal case is that you have these three functional units or these three boxes, they're working at the same time. And it's possible if you feed data from left to right, the uh, output of FFT will be the input of frequency space filter, and the output of frequency space filter will be the input of inverse FFT. So you can pass this data from stages in the pipeline fashion. Now these three boxes, three uh, red boxes here, they are active at the same time. They are working on some data, and that's good. So we keep the computation units busy. That's good for us because we you know, truly utilize all the uh, available resources. Also keep in mind that these three units, when they work at the same time, they're working on different data. That's why we, we call this example uh, as a task parallelism, because we're now focusing on more on the task rather than looking at the data. The data uh, will be feed, uh, fed into this pipeline uh, from left to right, and at any single moment, 
these three functional units, they are working on different data. But they, uh, the bottom line is the, these three units, uh, these three computational units are working, uh, operation, uh, operating at the same time. Now we're going to use another example to explain more about these parallelism. Uh, given this example, uh, to find the number of occurrences of a string of character in a body of text. So you have, let's say, one full page of text. It has hundreds or two hundreds of words. And uh, now you're given one single word. And you are asked uh, how many times this particular word occur, uh, occur uh, in this text. So this is the problem we want to um, solve. This problem is different from the uh, vertex multiplication. Uh, it has its own characteristics. This um, problem can be divided to comparison of n potential matches. Um, so we'll, we'll explain how we do that. Uh, but the idea is that you can, of course, compare this single word with a sequence of words in a text one by one. Um, but uh, you can also break these uh, that sequence um, word sequence in a text into different pieces, and you can even divide into one single word at, the, at a time. You can compare the given word with these n words uh, at the same time, because that's these individual words in the text are independent as to the um, uh, tell you the number of occurrences in a the text. They are highly, um, this comparison can be very uh, uh, parallel uh, in it, and also this parallelism can be um, even going down to a single word comparison. So let's see what we're trying to do here. You're given this text uh, which has 200, 300, even more uh, words. And so we're going to break down these into individual words uh, using spaces or um, punctuation marks in between to uh, isolate them. And given another word, this is another input word, let's say acid. And we will need to find out how many times this particular word occurs in the given text. So if you break uh, this text into these n words, then you can do this comparison. This is the string compare to compare this asset with this uh, individual words. As long as you have n parallel comparison units, you can perform this comparisons, n comparisons at the same time. And of course, you need to uh, find out the result by uh, gathering all these comparison results. If the comparison gives you a positive answer, so if it's equal, then that returns a one. So you're going to collect, you know, how many ones are there um, as the output from these comparison uh, units. Um, if you look at uh, even at finer granularity or even you know um, a smaller scale of um, parallelism. You can perform this comparison, this string comparison, by comparing these letters uh, in parallel. Uh, assuming that we're not counting the uh, overlapping words, so you can just compare the first letter from this uh, input word with the first letter uh, of this uh, word in the text. So all these uh, letter uh, letter comparisons can be done at the same time. So that's another level of parallelism. Um, so also in this uh, particular example, we have uh, data parallelism and also task parallelism. We have data parallelism because we break down these um, original data set into smaller um, data units, data sets. And then we perform the same operation on them. Uh, and also, we uh, perform this um, comparison task uh, uh, in parallel.
The second stage of the comparison is the collect collecting the comparison result from these uh, individual comparators. So this is so-called reduction process. Reduction is uh, a summation process typically, uh, and it collects the uh, intermediate results from these parallel resources and gather them uh, and uh, do uh, post-processing and then eventually produce the final result. So let's say the output from these uh, comparison units are ones indicating they match. So the final uh, number uh, after adding all these outputs will tell you how many times this word occurred in the original text. 